Father, would you open the word to us? We, under, we, we get it, Lord, that we have to come with soft, yielded, obedient hearts to you. And we choose to do that now. To hear, to see, and to let our hearts change. I, first of all, stand in line for that. Come, Lord, and feed us and teach us. Grace us to understand your apostle, that he might make us strong and healthy. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. All right, we're in, we're in uh, an interesting chapter. We're in Romans chapter 9. Uh, last week we talked about Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And uh, we enjoyed that. Now, <laughs> you can see what I mean by the challenges of it. Tonight, we're going to look at hardening of the heart and softening. Verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Would you read verse 18 out loud with me? So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. All right, let's look at our discussion guide. The Bible clearly teaches that God is good, and there is nothing evil in him at all. Would you agree with that? I give you one example. It just came to the top of my head, but there's many. So when we come across a passage that seems to suggest that he's responsible for hardening a person's heart, we naturally find the idea troubling. It reopens the question of God's character. Is he pure goodness, or does he have a dark side? Could he be responsible for causing a person's stubborn disobedience? Or is it our own choices that cause this? We need an answer because these two views of him actually represent two different gods. Can I trust that everything he does is good? Can I run to him with any problem and assume his will is to save and restore? The statement, he hardens whom he desires, raises this troubling issue. Does it for you? When you read that, do you go, what sad? I mean, I thought you wanted people to repent, Lord. Why would you harden their hearts? Why would you make it worse? First of all, I want you to see there um, in this next section, notice verse 14 opened up with what shall we say then? You'll notice that as we read through Romans, Paul repeats certain phrases. And we encounter two of them in this passage. Before we explain these verses, let's discover what he means by this. What shall we say then? He means, what answer do we give to the doubts or confusion produced by what I just said? Now, I give you a list of them. He says that a number of times, and I didn't try to find everyone. I just took some. But you notice you've got a whole bunch of them. What shall we say then? What then shall we say to this? He, he, he rephrases it a little bit differently, but he says it over and over again. And the other one that you'll find in this passage is, so then. Meaning, here is the lesson we're to learn from this. What shall we say that to this? What answer do we give to the doubts or confusion produced by what I just said? So then, here's the lesson we are to learn from this. Now look at it again. Let's go back to our text. What shall we say then? And in other words, what answer do we give to the confusion or problem that I just raised? And what was the problem he just raised? Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Is that fair? particularly when you just told us that it has nothing to do with their lives. How can you hate a baby? Why would you like one and not the other? Why did you pick the younger over the older one when all of our culture says the older should go, not the younger? What's the deal? So Paul says, how do we answer the problem I just, I just raised in your mind? And then go down a little bit, he's, and he, he gives you the statement from Moses, uh, the God's statement to Moses, and then he says, so then, and he 
In other words, here is the lesson we're to learn from this. Verse 16, then, is the lesson for verse 15. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Lesson number one. And then he quotes the opposite side of the picture. He opposite, quotes God actually hardening a man's heart, not giving mercy, but withdrawing his presence, as it were. And then he says, verse 18, notice, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. That's our lesson. All right, let's go down those verses. My first task tonight is to, to have us understand that passage as Paul met it. Verse 14, if Jacob and Esau were both sinful, yet God gave eternal life to Jacob, but not his twin brother, that makes it appear God is ignoring the promises in the law and engaging in favoritism. Is God unjust? I mean, come on, the law said, choose this day, that will you have life or will you have death? Keep, keep the law and you'll live. Doesn't it say that? It does. I give you the reference. Trust me. And Paul has just said it doesn't matter how hard you try. God won't give you mercy based on that. I mean, can you see where a, a, a Jewish reader is going, what? What? I mean, this, this, is really, this is really strange. Is God unjust? And why does he pick the younger over the older? We always pick the older. Verse 15. Is God unjust? No. God is functioning according to his predetermined plan, which we saw earlier in Romans 8, verse 28 through 30. His grace cannot be earned or deserved. It's a freely given gift, and he alone decides to whom he will give this gift. That's the answer he gave to Moses when he begged for mercy for Israel after they worshiped the golden calf. The quote that Paul gives there in verse uh, Verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, is what God said to Moses after he went up on the mountain and said, Oh, God, forgive them. And then he says, And if you don't forgive them, he says, Take my name, blot it out of the book of life. Basically, send me to hell. And God says to him, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I'll, I'll, have, I, I'll, I'll, I'll not on who I choose not to. By the way, what did he do? What did God do in that case? Come on. He gave them what? Mercy. He forgave them after they drank crushed up idol. Remember, he ground it up and put it in the water. No, that's Moses. Verse 16 says, so it doesn't depend. Here's our lesson, Paul says. Here's the lesson you should learn from that. It doesn't depend on the man who wills, the man who runs. In other words, human effort. But on God who has mercy. We cannot force God to give us his mercy by trying to live a good life and zealously keeping his laws, which goes totally against the religious approach that everybody had in mind. In fact, didn't Brian just say that? Right there out of, out of second, was it second or first Peter? First Peter? I don't remember. And he said, all right, now that's religion. He says, unless you look at what it came before it, the mercies of God. So we serve the Lord out of the mercies of God, out of thankfulness. But in the, in the other way of thinking, you keep the laws, you do what you're told, and God will give you mercy. Paul's saying just the opposite. We cannot force him to give us mercy by trying to live a good life, and keeping his laws. He has the right to set his own standard. And what's his standard? He has chosen to grant mercy to those who repent and believe regardless of their previous lifestyle. Somebody say, thank heavens. That's why I'm here. Amen? This is good news if you begin to unpack what he's saying. Verse 17. This process flows in two directions. Now here, verse 17, we've got the thing about Pharaoh. Oh, boy. I, I, this purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And we recall he hardened Pharaoh's heart, didn't we? This process flows in two directions. Not only does he give grace, he also withdraws it. 
Scripture shows us an example of someone God hardened after he refused to repent. He took a hard-hearted king and actually hardened him further. He gave him the stubborn courage, probably, and this is my speculation, probably through heightened pride and anger, to keep saying no long after most reasonable people would have released Israel out of simple self-preservation, if not repentance. Now, come on, how many of those plagues would you have to go through before you said, get out of here, just take your stuff and leave? You know, I, I used to think, I always thought that the gnats were, were little gnats. I just read that there were mosquitoes. Yeah, that that's really what that's talking about. Can you imagine? Ooh, frogs, mosquitoes, the Nile is, 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 is blood red and gooey probably. Uh, the, the darkness, the, how, your cattle are all dying. At what point would you go, go on? Get out of here. You're not repentant. It's not like you're going to fall on your face and worship God. You're saying, get out of here. Take your stuff and get out of here. Wouldn't you say that? A reasonable person would. But not Pharaoh. He had help from heaven. God just kept hardening him. So he kept saying no. So the plagues get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And God's reputation over the entire Middle East is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as everyone hears how God is single-handedly trouncing the gods of Egypt. He made it... <clears throat> Pharaoh's stubbornness made it possible for God to perform a series of remarkable miracles. I give You can look these up. I'll give you the references. Which enhanced his reputation in Egypt and the surrounding nations. There's some fabulous references that when, when, as Israel came into the, to the Canaanite lands and all these lands, they were terrified of Israel because they'd heard what God had done to the Egyptians, the most powerful nation on earth. If God can beat the Egyptians and, and their gods, what chance do we have against the God of Israel? In a sense, this was an early form of evangelism. It is. God's getting his reputation out. The true and living God, the God whom is above all gods, is the God of Israel. That's the message they're all getting. Verse 18. And this process is still at work today, Paul was saying. God has the right to give mercy to Gentiles and believing Jews. Even though they previously lived sinful lives and to use the hostility of unbelieving Jews to redirect the focus of the early church evangelism away from Israel and the synagogues and on to responsive Gentiles. What did I just say? Turn with me to Acts 13. I will show you the phenomenon he's referring to. This is what Paul means. Acts 13, verse 42. There's a number of examples. I just picked one. Paul and Barnabas were going out, and people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. And they are, uh, where are they? I should know. It's blanking. In Galatian cities. So they must be there in, anyway, never mind. Paul and Barnabas were going out, and the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. When the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing God proselytes, in other words, Gentiles who had become, uh, who had worshiping the God of Israel, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when what? The Jews. Now, that doesn't mean all the Jews, does it? Because a bunch of them are believing. It, but it means a, some, a, the Jew, a number of Jewish leaders, probably you're kind of your ultra-Orthodox, saw the crowds and were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul, arguing with him and blaspheming. And you know who they blasphemed. It would have been Jesus. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said it was necessary 
this is a quote, that the word of God be spoken to you first, you Jews, since, since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning where? To the Gentiles. And now he quotes, he quotes uh, Isaiah, for the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light to the Gentiles that you might bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited devout women of, the, of, the, of prominence, in other words, wealthy women, wives of, 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 of leaders, and leading men of the city, and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But they, that would be Paul and Barnabas, shook off the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When you shake the dust off your feet, you're saying, God, I don't want any of this clinging to my feet because God's going to judge all of you, you terrible people. When he shakes it out of their robes, it says, so shall God shake you out of his robes on the judge day of judgment. So Paul, when he leaves, doesn't just leave quietly. When he leaves, he goes... In other words, God will get you for that. Do you see what just happened? Where's the first place they went? The synagogue. Some Jews believed. But then you have this strange hardening, this inexplicable anger, violence, uh, tireless pursuit. They'll chase them from city to city. It's just like, out of, out of, it's out of proportion. It's bizarre. This is the hardening he's referring to. The God is, when, they, when, when these Jews reject their Messiah, reject the idea that Messiah died and rose again from the dead, reject Jesus as their Messiah, there's a hardening of their heart, and not just unbelief, but anger and hostility rise up in them. Now, what does that anger and hostility do? It sends the gospel out of the, out of the Jewish community and into the Gentile community. Why would you need to sort of blast it out there? Because the Jews, just like anyone else, will naturally go to their own people, just as we do. And they had to be forced out of that, their own culture group, and that, even their own prejudice against Gentiles to carry the gospel outward. So in this hostility that ramps up, they are literally blasted out of the Jewish communities into these Gentile communities, and the churches begin filling up with Gentiles by the tens of thousands, tens of thousands. In the same way as he used Pharaoh's stubbornness to evangelize the nations surrounding Egypt, he was using the hostility of the Jews to do the same. In both cases, his motive was to save the greatest number of people. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the hardening he's speaking of. Now, hardening the heart. Basically, what we want to know is, do humans harden their own hearts, or does God reach in to prevent someone from repenting or cause them to do evil? The answer emerges when we understand a truth Taught by Jesus, Moses, Isaiah, and Paul. Let's start with Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew 13. Who starts this? Do we harden our hearts or does God harden our hearts? Which is it? Jesus is asked here, uh, why do you speak to the people in parables? Verse 11, Matthew 13. He answered them, to you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, I'll teach you directly. But to them it has not been granted. For the, whoever has, why don't you read verse 12? For whoever has, to him shall more be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. Has what? If I have something, I'm going to get more of it. If I lack it, I'm going to have even what I have taken away from me. What's he talking about? Faith, repentance, yeah. 
To those who have repentant hearts, to those who are walking with God, they, are, they have already a measure of revelation, a measure of understanding given to them. When you and I listen to God's word with a tender, obedient heart, it is revealed to us. We understand. But you and I, if we don't like the word, we don't want to hear the word of God. And I don't just mean my preaching. We're talking about the true word of God. But when we don't want to hear God's word to us, we close down. We harden. Uh, he'll say that in a minute. We harden ourselves. But God withdraws his revelation. It's a two-way street. I didn't know that, really. I learned that in this lesson this, time, this week. This thing about the hardening of the heart's two directions. I harden, but he withdraws. That's a terrible thing. So he says, it, it, you, you, there's, no place, there's no neutral place to walk with God. You, don't, you can't float. You either are going on with God and getting more and more and more, or you're refusing to walk with God and you're going weaker and weaker and weaker. It's, there's no place of sitting in a middle, middle zone. Jesus goes on. He says, therefore, while I speak, to, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they don't see, while hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. Now, here's the deal. He says, if I come out and tell them the truth in clear, blunt, in-your-face terms, if I, if, I, if I prophesy at them, just go bang right in the nose and tell them the truth, they are not going to obey, which will do what? Exactly. And Jesus says, I don't want to make them worse. They're already bad enough. So he says, what I do is I, I'm, I tell them stories. Those who have eyes to hear, ears to hear, those who are hungry at all, will begin to reflect on my stories. And the truth will emerge. And they'll go, oh, I see. So God is like the father who comes running out to meet the prodigal. See, he's glad when sinners come back. See? But if I'm hard-hearted and I don't want to know the will of God, it's just a story. I don't even get it. I don't, I don't have any clue what it means. I don't care what it means. And it doesn't make me worse. When I say no to God, I get harder. I make a choice, but God also withdraws. When I say yes to God, I get greater revelation. I'm in a position to see more and understand more and walk more deeply. Every time you and I take a step of faith, we grow. It's a, it's a remarkable process. The rest of our lives, it's like that. Then he quotes, then he quotes the prophecy, you keep on under, hearing but will not understand. Keep on seeing but not perceive, for the heart of this people has become dull. Their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and, re and return, and I would heal them. Who has closed their eyes? ears and eyes? Who did it? Did God close them or did they close them? They closed them so that they wouldn't have to what? Understand with their heart and repent and I would heal them. You get it? All right, now let's go on. Um, Moses, now turn with me to Deuteronomy 29. This is, this is a deep truth, isn't it? It runs all through the Bible. And I'm just really getting a handle on it myself, if I have that. Verse 2, Deuteronomy is, of course, Moses' last words to the nation. He's an old man. They're about to go into the promised land, and this is his summing up of their history. Verse 2, Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt and to Pharaoh and all his servants in all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, those great signs and wonders. They've literally watched an ocean part, haven't they? They've had quail come. They've had water from a rock. They, all of this stuff. And verse 4 says, Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. And he begins to recite some of the miracles. <laughs> 
You were 40 years in the wilderness, and your clothes didn't wear out. Did it ever occur to you what's going on here? Your sandals didn't wear out. You have eaten bread. You have not eaten bread, nor drunk wine, nor strong drink, in order that you might know that I am the Lord your God. You've been out in the wilderness and you, without any of that stuff. And I, yet I supported you. I fed you with manna from heaven and water from a rock. But you never, you, never, you never stopped and repented and said, this is an amazing God. This is the living God. I must repent. I must turn. You, you haven't done that. And notice he gives credit to who in verse 4? The Lord has not given you a heart. He told the nation they lack spiritual understanding because they refused to believe and obey. He appealed to their will, saying, if they chose to obey, they would be blessed. But if they chose to rebel, they would be cursed. Turn a page or so to chapter 30. I'll show you where he, he, he concludes this and what he says. Verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments and his statutes, that you may live and multiply and the Lord may bless you in the land where you are to entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today, you shall surely perish and you shall not prolong your days in the land where you're crossing the Jordan to enter it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. What's the next words? Choose life. Say, choose life. Yeah, notice the choice. We're the ones who choose life or we choose death. God doesn't start the, the issue. He isn't the one who says, now I'm going to harden you so you won't and I'm going to touch you so you do. We make the initial issue. But God ratifies it in a terrible way so that you may choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. The warning here is they, if they hardened their hearts, God would respond by withdrawing his hand of protection, knowing full well, I mean God knowing full well, the calamity that would befall them. So when I harden, he lifts his hand. He lifts his presence, because that's what his hand means. Now Isaiah. One, one more. Isaiah 29. There is so much in Isaiah, you would almost not need anything else. Verse 13. Then the Lord said, be Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they do what? Remove their hearts far from me. Who's responsible? Yeah, the people are. And their reverence for me consists, consists of tradition learned by rote. They're religious, but they have not repented and not truly given me their hearts. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be concealed. I'll do a miracle, he says. I will take the Holy Spirit off, and they'll have no revelation from me. Their wise men will be foolish. Their prophets will not hear or see. I will lift my hand, and they'll not hear, for they've refused to hear what I've said to them. The problem, Isaiah says, starts with the people. When they withdraw from God, then he withdraws from them. Spiritual revelation will cease, and they will be left to the foolishness of their human reasoning. Isaiah 6, 8 through 13 is the passage Jesus quotes in Matthew. God told Isaiah his prophetic ministry would actually serve to harden the people's hearts more because they would refuse to repent. He said nothing Isaiah could do could prevent the coming calamity. I'll just tell you what he says. It's the passage Jesus just quoted. How would you like this if the Lord said, all right, we're going to start your ministry today. And here's your assignment. I want you to prophesy the truth. Not like Jesus taught in parables, to be kind. You, prophet Isaiah, you get them right between the nose. You're going to tell them the truth in unmistakable terms. And young man, as he was at the time, young man, they're not going to listen to you at all. Have a nice life. 
you are going to prophesy your guts out the rest of your life, and they will not listen. And the calamity that's going to come upon them, the Babylonians, they will be destroyed and deported. You can't stop it. It's going to happen. They won't listen. But your assignment, prophesy your heart out. Here we go. Have a nice ministry. Isn't that a terrible thing? He even talks about the remnant. He says, but I will leave a remnant. Because the seed of Messiah is in the remnant. I will preserve my people so that the, so Jesus Christ can be born. So do I withdraw from God or does he withdraw from me? The answer is both. But I am the one who initiates the problem. I harden my heart, then he withdraws the presence of his spirit, leaving me to be helplessly dominated by my own sinful nature and exposed to demonic deception. I'm left enslaved to my fallen nature and whatever demonic influence the devil sends. This hardens me further. Nice picture, huh? Here's the good news. Let's go back to Romans chapter 11. The situation is not necessarily permanent. The good news is that those who have been hardened can still repent. When we talk about God hardens people, it sounds f fatal, doesn't it? It sounds final. Like God hardened those, those Jews who rejected the gospel. I mean, they blasphemed, they did this, and God hardened them. He turned them into vessels of wrath. Ooh. He used them to drive the gospel out to the Gentiles. And then look what Paul says in Romans 11, verse 23. It just, it just catches you off guard. You don't expect it. And they also, speaking of the Jews, all of these vessels of wrath and these hard hearts, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they'll be grafted back into that tree of the family of Abraham, the tree of eternal life. They, if you... <clears throat> They'll be grafted back in, for God is able to gra graft them in again. Did you see that? Hardness isn't permanent, necessarily. The good, I read that. Having told us that many Jews had been hardened and, many, and were being used like Pharaoh, and having called them along with the Gentiles' vessels of wrath, Paul makes it absolutely clear that their fallen condition need not be permanent. It is a symptom of their rebellion, but if they choose to repent, the disease can be healed. They also, he said, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. This surprising note of hope is a beautiful reminder that God always remains faith willing to forgive. This Surprising note of hope is a beautiful reminder that God always remains willing to forgive. He always longs for the prodigal to come home and welcomes all that do. Please say amen to that. Amen. Spiritual dryness. Now we're going to apply this to us. Here we go. God doesn't take the Holy Spirit away from a born-again believer. So long as faith still burns in their hearts. He dwells inside us. But I'm sure we've all discovered that we can become spiritually dry. Anyone not ever have been spiritually dry? We can go through seasons when he seems far away, when no one seems to be listening when we pray, when the influence of our flesh grows stronger and stronger. Obviously, some measure of this hardening process can happen to us as well. Here are truths we need to remember. One, God inhabits the entire universe. It's impossible, impossible to be anywhere without him being present. You knew that? God inhabits, the, God inhabits the physical body of a believer. We become living temples. That's what those verses say there. God lives inside you. He dwells inside of us. But his active presence is not everywhere all the time. There are times and places his presence abides strongly and times and places he feels very absent. Do you know what I'm saying? Believers are warned not to grieve the spirit or set our minds on the flesh, which produces death. 
He is everywhere. He dwells in me. And I can be places and be in conditions when I'm dry and lonely. I can be in places that are terrible and evil. Have you? And by places, I mean locations. God's active presence his, it's, is not the same everywhere. You, the four o'clock service, often have to worship this room warm. You're the point of the spear. You are the first ones for the weekend who worship and, and kind of break through in this room. The other services have a far easier time because they walk in to the warmth you leave behind. I, that's just, I've observed that over 20 years. This is a church. We love the Lord here. But as, as we press in and worship him together and preach the word and honor Jesus, there comes a stronger and stronger settling of his active presence. You can say that's subjective, but it's so subjective, I think the, the dogs and cats in the room would know. I'm serious. You know, unbelievers know. You'll have unbelievers go, I don't know what that was, but there was somebody there. You can feel it, can't you? And then there's other times when there's, even if you're in the middle of a church service, you're going to be having all kinds of religious things going on, and he's not in the room. It doesn't feel like it. You know theologically he is. You know that he dwells inside of you, but there's no sense of him personally, actively there. Am I describing this so that it's accessible? Yeah. Softening the heart. If I find I've hardened my heart and his presence has withdrawn from me, what should I do? Well, the prophets say this. First of all, Jeremiah, I love this. Would you read that? You will seek me. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Do it again. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The funny thing about me is I'll, I'll go through all kinds of deals, but I don't, I have to get desperate somehow before I really get serious. I coast. I'm a lazy man. I worship, I praise. I don't, you know. But when I start getting dry, I'll let it go on a long time. I let it go on until it gets so bad that I am desperate before I'll actually make the effort to do what it takes to break through. I've done that all my life, I'm, and I still do. I'm not proud of it. I, I'm thinking of a time right now, Mary and I were on a, on a, on a thing with our college. It was, a, tra it was a, a, a program in which we went around the world uh, five months, and you had five courses en route. And we were in Japan for a month studying uh, Japanese art history in Kyoto. And we were staying in a Buddhist, a, a modern Buddhist monastery. Uh, I can still remember the name, but if I pronounce it, some of you will know Japanese and will laugh at me, so I won't. And had nothing to do with the place. We'd been four months en route traveling. I had not really been in a church service or real worship service in, in four months. Oh, I said my prayers and stuff like that. But I was getting drier and drier. And somehow I remember one evening in this, in this really beautiful hostel of a monastery, however they put that together, I thought to myself, I am so lonely for God, I can't stand it. It wasn't guilty. It wasn't, if I don't do this, I'm losing points in heaven. Nothing to do with anything like that. It's, I'm empty. I'm lonely. People will come up and they'll talk to me after service, and sometimes I'll, get, I'll begin to hear this. Pastor, I don't have any direction in my life. I'm lonely. I'm empty. I'm dry. 
and I think what they want me to do is put my hands on them and go, you know, and, and fix it. And I am so powerful that I can, of course, do that anytime I want. No, they, they come up, and, they, and I think they want a prayer, and that's fair enough. But what I'll generally do when as I start hearing that cycle is I'll say, you haven't spent time with the Lord lately, have you? The answer is inevitably, well, no, but I've been busy. I'm working two jobs. And, and all of those are legitimate, legitimate issues. I do fully understand. But people, the way you and I are wired as humans, he says, you'll find me if you seek for me with all your heart. There's a, there is a, there's a thing to it. So here I am in Japan in this uh, Buddhist monastery. And one night I am just so dry, I can't stand myself. And I thought, I've got to get alone with him. And I went walking around looking for a private place. And I ended up up in the, and it was just, no, I didn't break through anything. But I ended up in the, in the, uh, in the air conduct conditioning ducts at the top. And there was windows you could look out. I don't remember how I got there, but I've sat down on an air conditioning duct and looked out a window at, at Kyoto at night. And what came to me was Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, I know the whole psalm, but I didn't get any farther than that. O oh Lord, our Lord. There I go, excuse me. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. And I simply was deeply aware of David's heart. That he knew the same God I knew. And I could tell he loved him. In the way he said those words. And I just sat there and wept. And fellowshiped with the Lord. Sitting on an air conditioning duct. At the top of a Buddhist monastery. Why is it that I seem to have to get really, 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 really dry and miserable before I get really serious? See, I could have sat on that same air conditioning duck with half-heartedness and said a little something, read a little something, had a little devotion time, been fine, and not had a breakthrough. But I was fully engaged. I, my heart was in this thing. Seek with him with all your heart. Second is repent. Would you read verse Isaiah 40 there? A voice calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. That's talking about, the picture is, here's the wilderness. You need to clear the rocks and the valleys and the things that are in the way. Make a road so that the king can come back and dwell in the city. Meaning, get everything out of your heart that's blocking it. Clear the stones, the garbage, the junk, the, the, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the anger, the self-pity, the doubts, the confusion. Clear the junk out of the, out of the thing so that he can come in. Today, as we were worshiping, we were calling on the Lord, I want your presence. Uh, we sing other songs, you know, uh, uh, we want you, Lord, your presence to come down. But people, if we want his presence, we have to make a highway. And you make the highway by getting the stuff out of the heart. You can't just say, come, Lord, because he won't. I am to clear the highway. I'm to repent. I'm to clean my heart. I'm to do business with God. Because often the reason he feels distant to me is there's stuff in there. And so repentance and seeking the Lord and confessing my anger, my bitterness, my, my, my fears, my doubts, my, my sins, cleansing that stuff. Not, not, out of, not a guilt trip, but just virtually going, get out of there. Get out of here. Get out of here. I don't want that in there. I don't want that in there. I don't want anything in the way because I want him. I want his presence. Lastly, Read that with me, Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. 
In other words, don't stop till he shows up. Well, how long do I have to wait? I don't know. Depends on you. Depends on him. I don't know. It's a process, isn't it? But you become dogged. You become relentless. I'm, I'm here, Lord, till you show up. We are very busy American people. And this is hard for us to do. We are used to very quick retrievals of information, very quick processes of things. And yet your heart doesn't process that quickly. You and I need to give God time. And we need to find time for him. If you've grown dry, if his presence is far away, he's willing to come back. He wants to make his dwelling in us. But I have to come to the place where I'm, I'm ready to do business with God. I seek for him with all my heart. I must clear the road of obstacles. There's a repentance and a cleansing and an honest integrity before him of getting anything out of the way that it shouldn't be there. And there is a waiting on him that says, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. God until I've heard from you. We provide that prayer retreat for that kind of reason. Sabbaths are meant to be that for you and me, where we take a Sabbath, take a part of a day, do something where you give serious time and sit with him. What you will find is he's there. He will come. But make no mistake, when, there's, when we're hard, there is a withdrawal on his part. Now, he doesn't leave us, but something of his presence, that active, manifest, personal presence does withdraw. And you feel it, and I feel it. And it's a terrible thing for us. And so he says, seek me. Prepare the way. Wait on me, and I will come to you, and I'll refresh you. And that's where we find life. All of a sudden, purpose and joy is there. In those moments when I'm close to him like that, I just wish I could kind of hold my breath and go to heaven. It's all I need. There's nothing else this world offers me like that. And I, I'm a blessed man. I got a lot of good things in my life. I am not complaining. But nothing even holds anything to what I have when I have him. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Contentment. Genuine contentment. Joy. Hope. That sense of, I'm loved. I'm okay, man. I'm not, a, I'm not a bad kid. He loves me. He approves me. He's with me. I'm not afraid of death. Oh, nothing sweeter than those moments with God. And I think that's what he's asking for us. When we seek him, we'll find him. When we repent, he returns. When we wait, he strengthens us. We run and not grow weary. We we'll walk and will not faint. Would you stand with me? So we have an invitation from the Word of God to us today. That if we're dry, there's a reason. An invitation to come, seek for Him with all our hearts. Prepare our, the highway for the King. Wait on Him. Till we're strengthened and refreshed. Heavenly Father, we together as a people stand before you. So often busy and tired and, and, and many of us having a difficult time disciplining ourselves. Yet, Lord, this isn't about discipline. <laughs> it's, it's about being desperate, desperate enough to put in the time, desperate enough to not play games, Def desperate enough to have our full attention and our full focus. 
because we long for you. We long for you, Lord. You are indeed our, 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 our joy and our sweetness. You are, your presence is, is that our portion in life. It's what makes everything else change. And we ask that you would teach each one of us, sons and daughters, teach us how to live with you in that place, not having to come momentarily when we're desperate, but to live with you and be strengthened by it always. I pray for that grace on me. I pray for it on us as a church. We ask for it in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. You know what that means, by the way? His presence. It's talking about his presence. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Amen. God's presence be with you. Have a wonderful week. Thanks for coming.